Good morning. Welcome back to the Broadcast Retirement Network. I'm Jeff Snyder, and this is BRN Sunday. I'll be joined by members of the media today, academia, and financial services as we analyze all the news this week in retirement markets, technology, personal finance, so much more. We've got another great show, so sit back, relax, and enjoy this episode of BRN Sunday. Well, let's kick things off with a look at personal finance. And joining me on the line, she is personal finance reporter for The Motley Fool. Let's welcome back to the program, Mari Backman. Mari, great to talk to you as always. Thanks so much for joining us this morning. Thanks, Jeff, for having me. Pleasure is all ours. Uh, let's talk about these COVID relief bill checks that have started to drop in people's accounts. Um, I know you wanted to talk about timeline and a lot more. Yeah, well, so um, obviously this is really good stuff. So lawmakers moved quickly to get that relief bill signed into law. Uh, it actually happened, I believe, a day earlier than was initially planned. So what that meant, Jeff, is that um, once that was signed into law, the IRS was able to immediately start issuing stimulus payments. <clears throat> Excuse me, payments. Sure. My voice gave out there a you little crack, bit. Your voice payment. cracked with yeah. the, just in the excitement of them giving out the payments. I guess, right? I'm, I'm very <laughs> emotional over these stimulus payments. Okay. Apparently, we've been waiting for so long. So, um, <laughs> oh, stimulus. So, uh, so here's what's happening. Um, so, the IRS issued payments starting last weekend, and at this point, a lot of those payments have actually cleared bank accounts for those who got them via direct deposit. So that's really good news. It means that a lot of people have access to their money. Not everyone does, though. So I want to just get into that for a minute because I don't want people out there panicking, you know, thinking, oh, my gosh, you know, Bob's got his money, Joe's got his money, why didn't I get my money? So... um, So the reality is, if you are entitled to that money via direct deposit, you very possibly have it already, or if not, it's coming and it's coming soon. But a lot of people aren't signed up for direct deposit. The only reason you would be signed up for direct deposit is if you filed a recent tax return and got a refund Mm -hmm. via direct deposit, or if you actually took the step to go onto the IRS's tool that was open earlier in the year and you, you know, put in your bank account information. But a lot of people didn't do that. So if you're not eligible for direct deposit, you're going to have to wait for a check to come in the mail. And don't panic because the check may not be there quite yet. Uh, The IRS can only send checks in a certain quantity per week. So it can sort of like mass blast that mass blast out these um, stimulus payments via direct deposit, but the checks are just going to be batch by batch by batch. So I think so far it sent, I want to say, around 150000 or so, okay. um, but that's all that's gone out so far. So they're going to be trickling in slowly week after week. So if you're getting a check in the mail, uh, it very well may not come till April, late April, possibly May. Um, so that's not a thing to... To panic over. So, Mari, what now? If we once we get these checks, um, what what do you think we should do with them? I mean, does it go into the emergency fund? Does it? Because we're talking for indi- individuals, it's fourteen hundred dollars, and then for a married couple or partnership or whatever it's called now these days, it's uh, twenty eight hundred dollars. Plus, you get money for families, right? So what? For, we, for dependents, yeah. yeah. So that's a, great, that's a great question. So, you know, what to do with the stimulus. Um, I sort of have this little hierarchy um, that I like to, you know, advise people on. So priority number one is your immediate needs. If your paycheck has been cut, if you're in a situation where you're just not earning enough to cover, you know, your immediate basic needs, things like shelter, uh, groceries, medications, that's obviously where you're going to send your stimulus. You're going to spend it on those essentials that you can't, put off and you're going to spend that you're going to spend that money on those things also so that you don't have to necessarily dig yourself into more debt just to live just to just to pay for those things so that's priority one Mm -hmm. then we're going to go down to the next notch okay if you don't need your stimulus for those you know absolute basics those near-term needs then you're going to take a look at your emergency fund so 
ideally, you know, we always tell people you want to save between three to six months worth of living expenses in the bank because that way in case you get stuck with like whether it's a home repair or a car repair or a medical bill or an extended period of unemployment, you want to make sure you have a cushion. And what's funny, Jeff, is that that three to six months threshold has always sort of been the, the gold standard, if you will. And, you know, I, I don't want to get into the whole minutia of like why you might choose three months over six months because that could be a whole other segment, but that's pretty much been the standard. But, you know, this whole pandemic has kind of shed light on the fact that, like, you never know when a crazy situation might erupt and you might need more than six months' worth of, of living expenses. And I think a lot of people are starting to rethink that six-month threshold and say, hmm, maybe I should do a little better. So step number two is look at your emergency fund, see where it's at, see how much money you have in there. I mean, if you're comfortable with what you have, if you're happy with what you have, maybe you've got five months' worth of bills in there, that's pretty good, you might say, okay, I'm good there. If you've got three months' worth of bills, you might say, hmm, I should be doing better. You might also be a little bit conservative and say, well, I've got half a year's worth of living expenses, but, like, heck, I know people during COVID who are out of work for nine months, so maybe I should put my stimulus there. So a lot of that's going to depend on what your account looks like and where your comfort level lands. Then we're going to go to Tier 3, okay? So Tier 1 is basics. Tier 2 is emergency savings. Tier 3, if you've got unhealthy debt, I would advise to then take that stimulus cash and use it to pay off a credit card balance, two credit card balances, uh, a personal loan, which is not necessarily as unhealthy as a credit card balance, but it's probably something you'd rather knock out. Maybe you've got a medical bill that you're paying off over time. Um, that's the sort of stuff you want to try to get rid of. You know, when we think about debt, right, we tend to break it into two categories. So there's like unhealthy debt and healthy debt. And I tend to lob, you know, mortgages and auto loans into the healthy category because those type of debts, they eventually help you own an essential asset. One of those assets, your home, can, can rise in value over time. The other, unfortunately, your car is going to decrease in value over time. But either way, both of those loans are, are a type of loan that basically they're designed to be paid off over a pretty lengthy period of time, especially a mortgage. So, you know, if you're sitting on that stimulus and you're good on emergency savings and you're like, hmm, what debt do I have? And really your only debt is, you know, say a mortgage. I mean, you could put that money into your mortgage. You could. There's certainly nothing wrong with that. But I wouldn't say, you know, run out and do that because a mortgage is a very healthy, normal thing to have. But if you have a credit card balance, yeah, absolutely. That's where that money should go. And I know a lot of people, you know, the, they're calling this stimulus. And a lot of people are thinking that people are going to go out and spend. There's all this pent up demand. Is it your sense that people are going to, and I guess we're just doing this anecdotally, but are people going to say, okay, I've just been through this. I need to take the right steps to ensure my financial infrastructure is in place so I don't have problems going forward rather than spend it on the new going out to dinner, colored TV, whatever, whatever you know, is their fancy of the week? You know, I, I think it's going to be a mixed bag because there are a lot of people. It, it, it's really funny, but during this pandemic, you're seeing two really wide ends of the spectrum, right? You're seeing people who have been just battered financially, mm -hmm. and then you see people who are in a better spot than they've ever been. They're saving more money than ever because they're not commuting. Um, maybe, you know, they're, they're trying to be cautious about social distancing and whatnot, and so they're not going out to eat. They're not socializing. They're not traveling. So they're pocketing all this money, right? So. Mm -hmm. I think you're going to see it go both ways. I think there are going to be people who say, all right, I'm in a really bad spot. I'm going to use my stimulus to try to, you know, improve my financial picture. But then I think you're going to see people, you know, let's not forget that individuals earning, you know, 75000 or less and, you know, couples earning 150 or less, they're getting that full $1,400. So if you, you know, if you're a couple earning 150 you live in a fairly, you know, low-cost part of the country. You don't have kids or animals, let's say. You know, you've got a pretty inexpensive home. You're, you haven't lost any income thus far. And all of a sudden, you've got, you know, $2,800 between the two of you. I mean, that's a nice amount of money. Yeah. And if you're doing well financially, you might say, all right, this is going toward our summer vacation. Hopefully, things will be better on the COVID front by summer. It'll be a little safer to travel. You know, you might say that, or you might say, hey, we've been wanting new living room furniture. We're going to treat ourselves to it. Why not? And there's nothing wrong with that. Um, you know, obviously, anytime someone spends stimulus money, you know, at a business, it's supporting that business and it's supporting the economy. So that's a good thing. Um, you know, and, and people who are in a good spot financially 
shouldn't hesitate to use that money to, like, make their lives better. I mean, we've all endured a pandemic now for, for over a year. So, yeah, do that. But, but only if you can. Only if, you know, there's not another area, financially speaking, that needs work. Uh, really good sound advice, sage advice, I would say, Mari. Mari Backman, always a pleasure chatting with you, and I walk away with some really good ideas. I hope the audience does as well. We look forward to chatting with, again with you again in the next few weeks. That sounds really great. Bye, Mari. All right, bye, Jeff. Welcome back. Now time to talk technology. Joining us on the line, he is lead advisor, executive producer for 7 Investing, Daniel Klein. Dan, great to talk to you. As always, thanks so much for joining us this morning. Ah, oh, hey there, Jeff. Thanks for having me. <laughs> the pleasure's all ours. Let's, uh, I know you, there's a couple things you want to talk about. I think, you know, looking at some of the stories you forwarded on, the big one to me beyond, and I want to get to Amazon in a second, is Uber to give UK drivers minimum wage, pension, and a holiday pay. Um, that's a pretty big deal, uh, whether it's in the UK or here in the States. Yeah. So here's the thing. I don't like this, but I actually think this is inevitable. I, I think in the US, we need a third class of worker. We need something in between gig worker and employee, where maybe you get paid benefits based on how many hours you work. So mm-hmm. if you, you work 20 hours, you get 50%. But in the UK, basically they're saying Uber workers are employees. Again, I don't agree with that. When you set your own schedule, when you could literally be driving for Uber and Lyft at the same time, I don't think that meets the definition of an employee. But I do think these conversations have to happen. And and I think they're going to happen in the US. We see a lot of states suing to make Uber or DoorDash or Lyft or, or whoever it is, make their workers employees. And again, I don't think that's correct. But I do think if you're working, you should have a path toward benefits, a path toward paid time off. Uh, When I was a vendor for Microsoft, I was a contractor, but I worked for an agency and the agency, uh, instead of paying me completely my cut of what Microsoft paid them, they made benefits available. They made a vacation pool available and, and that worked. So I think there are models to do this. Um, but I do think we're going to see some heavy handed things like we're seeing in the UK right now. Yeah. I I think, you know, when I saw this story I immediately, even reading the title, I thought about benefits, think about pensions. I think about liability when it comes to the employer having to pay those benefits. And you're right. There is a middle road, middle of the ground where they can offer you benefits. uh, Because I think overall that's the concern, right? How do you, if you are a gig, quote unquote, gig worker, temporary work or whatever the right terminology is, how do you get access to benefits? We're seeing this in the retirement retirement space with the SECURE Act, which allowed uh, partial employees, uh, part-time employees to be added to the 401k. Uh, typically, you need to work 1,000 hours. But um, you know this has broader, uh, I guess, concerns or, or impact to benefits in general. Yeah, it, look, it's a big problem. I, I, I have been self-employed for the past seven years uh, working for a pretty big company and now a very small company. And I'm lucky to have access to health insurance through my wife. And I have a 401k because I use a payroll company. Uh, but I had to do that all myself. There's not an easy path to those things, even if you're a highly paid self-employed worker. So I would argue that a gig worker is entitled to a minimum wage, meaning if you work an hour, you should make you know whatever it is, $10, $15 an hour. Uh, and you should have the ability to access a benefits pool which would be company subsidized. So if a full-time Uber worker gets X and Y, somebody who puts in 10 hours a week for Uber should have the option of buying into that pool with the company defraying some of the cost based on how much they work. I don't think this is all that complicated, and I think we're, we're letting it become very, very political. Yeah, I mean, this isn't there, – there are plenty of – to your point, there are plenty of times where I've worked as a consultant as well, um, and you, know, you have the opportunity to get benefits under certain – Retirement, uh, certain uh, benefit plans. So I don't think it's a big deal, but these things tend to become political because, you know, once it gets in the hands of the politicians, they, you know, they only make their living off of votes, not of, uh, not actually producing a service or, uh, or at least producing a product. Dan, let's switch gears. Talk about Amazon's telehealth aspirations. Um, some big news this week. Some interesting expansion plans nationwide this summer. Yeah. So I think we both acknowledge that healthcare needs to be disrupted, that the current system of of health insurance simply doesn't work. 
So what Amazon has done is they have a telemedicine-based healthcare plan that they've been testing with certain workers in their uh, Seattle area headquarters. They've now expanded that to all their employees and they're offering it to select companies in the Washington state area. So this is really Amazon you know, saying, hey, here's a new model for healthcare and how does it work? Well, it's a combination of telemedicine and actual nurses. So you might have an appointment with a doctor and that doctor might dispatch a nurse to your house to check your blood pressure or take blood or whatever it is. So it's a hybrid model. And I think we're going to see private companies like Amazon really flip the model where maybe health insurance just becomes about hospitalizations and surgeries and bigger things. And your routine medical care just becomes something that your company buys into and it becomes very, very easy. I, I actually had uh, my son had an allergy issue over the weekend and at fairly late at night, about 8.30 at night, we did a telemedicine appointment through my wife's health insurance, uh, sent a picture which made it very clearly that he was having some allergy issues with his eyes, had a prescription five minutes later, uh, found a 24 hour pharmacy, I drove about a half hour to pick it up. Otherwise, we would have had to go to a, a walk-in or an emergency room and that would have been a much less pleasant experience. So I really applaud Amazon for what they're doing. Well, I, you're not going to get an argument out of me that healthcare needs to be disrupted. I think benefits in general need to be disrupted. There has to be better ways. But you know, you've always got the legacy. Uh, you know, unless you're starting fresh, where you're building something from the ground up, a brand new industry, it's very hard to make change. And evoking change usually takes things in increments. But it's good to see. Look, Amazon's revolutionized so many parts of of business with retail, with books, with uh, uh, video, right, Dan? I mean, and even web services. I mean, they have really been at the forefront of a lot of this. Um, certainly, they can certainly drive change. And I'm not opposed to telehealth. We telehealth. We've seen it work and during the pandemic. I mean, I've taken had cases taken through telehealth. You've done it. Uh, we've talked about it on the show before. Yeah, and I don't think there's going to be one answer here. We've talked a lot about, about Apple's role in this, and I do think connected fitness devices are going to be a big part of this. I mean, you know, Jeff, that I obsess about my heart rate on my, my yes. Apple Watch. And, and your steps, and, and your steps, Dan. Yeah, and, and, and if I look at it, I'm like, okay, like my heart rate, I'm sitting on the couch and my heart rate's 92. Ooh. Why is it so high? Then I have to remember, oh, okay, I just had caffeine or I just read a news story that was exciting. So, you know, or you're listening I, I, to Seven Investing or BRN's podcast. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> it, it's interesting what can spike your, your heart rate. You know, everything from eating to being excited, but I track my resting rate. I track my recovery rate after a workout. I don't think we're that far along where your doctor right before your, your appointment with your permission is going to be able to log into your watch and pull out your blood pressure and your, your blood oxygen levels and, and maybe uh, you know, your hydration and, 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 and insulin levels and who knows what else. And that's going to allow for more informed medical care. I mean, in general, when you have a physical, you go get a physical, your doctor pokes and prods you, and you get blood work after the fact. So yep. only if something is truly wrong do they make a correction. I think connected fitness is going to speak into telehealth. And, you know, you might wake up and notice, oh, my God, why is my – my blood pressure 20% higher today, immediately log on to a doctor uh, and the doctor will ask you some questions and you'll say, oh, well, what did I have for dinner last night? Oh, I had, uh, I had Vietnamese pho. And I'll say, well, that's very high in sodium. Why don't you monitor you know, your next 48 hours? If it comes down, you might want to think about you know, being a little bit careful about sodium. And you would know, okay, I'm not having a crisis. I did something that impacted uh, you know, my levels. I once had a doctor's appointment and, and they, they, they did one of the tests and they, they found that my, my sugar level was really high. And they were smart enough to ask the question, uh, did you eat before you came here? And not only had I had eaten, I had had a large bowl of Fruity Pebbles, oh, yeah. which, ca which caused my, my sugar levels to, to spike. So it's going to be really important to track long-term data. And it's going to be the Apples working with the Amazons, working with the Fitbits and the Googles, which Google owns Fitbit. Who knows who else? They're going to figure this out. I don't think it's going to be the healthcare companies. Yeah, to, to the point we were discussing earlier, I think it's hard for legacy. There's too much of a fiefdom, and and you don't want they don't. You know, there's a desire not to cannibalize your existing profits. I do think it's going to take disruption from startups and existing technology firms. Well, Dan, uh, you, you've got my heart beating a little bit faster, knowing <laughs> that uh, knowing that we're going to be chatting again on Tuesday, this time on the network, to talk about. Uh, uh, all things tech. So until then, enjoy the rest of your 
weekend, and we'll talk to you again soon. I'll talk to you Tuesday, Jim. Bye, Dan. Welcome back. Now we're going to talk markets. Joining us on the line, he is the lead anchor for the TD Ameritrade Network. He actually hosts two shows, I think a total of six hours a day, plus all the prep work that goes into that. We're talking to Oliver Rennick. Oliver, great to talk to you as always. Thanks so much for joining us on the program during your, your break time. I think you're probably getting a cat nap around now. That is the plan shortly hereafter. Thanks, Jeff, as always. Appreciate okay, well, we won't, we won't take too much of your time, but I, what I always like to do with you is get your you know, three themes for the week because you, you, you bookend the programming on TDA. You're talking markets all day long, bonds, stocks, crypto, you name it, you're in it. So how do you see the week kind of playing out? Biggest theme coming into this week that remains the theme is that we have a uh, issue basically between the market and interest rates, and that is the fact that stocks are driven by largely big tech companies, um, and the NASDAQ in particular has been moving one-to-one trading basically identically with the price of the 10-year future. So that's an issue because there are a lot of folks who would make the case that that doesn't need to be that way, that tech companies can do well in a rising rate environment and an improving economy, of course. But right now it seems that our market is basically trapped uh, where when the yield is climbing, tech stocks are going down, in particular growth companies that are expensive. So the duration element in technology, which is a function of their valuations, is apparently powerful enough to even keep a group like semiconductors, which are very cyclical in nature, from continuing their ascent higher since we've had this move in bonds that has picked up the pace over the past month. Uh, So that's kind of the general main theme in terms of market dynamics. The other is that this continued after Jay Powell, which is kind of an important addendum to that because we have a Fed that is the most dovish ever in history. And for a lot of people, they're used to associating a dovish Fed with a rising market and lower bond yields. And we saw the market kind of latch onto that old mentality in the moments following Jay Powell's and the FOMC's statement, but it gave it back in a very extreme way. And then on Thursday, the third theme, which is the risk that reopening trades are also now a little bit expensive based on the status of the recovery, kind of showed up as investors dumped crude oil and one of the most severe moves in months and broke some kind of important technical things that were shaping up for crude. Now we're kind of back to the drawing board thinking about where crude can go next, just slamming it down 10% at one point. And with all of that, we saw them sell some of the reopening stuff too. Not as bad, and it barely even shows up on the charts, and it's probably nothing to worry about yet because of the momentum seems to be with these reopening trades. But it just does make us wonder – how ugly weakness in the broad market can get if tech can't get back on its feet, if the reopening stocks are now susceptible also to declines like we saw on Thursday. That's kind of a scary notion because there was nothing working on Thursday. There was nothing working. Bonds were down, so tech was down, and then eventually tech was down 2%, so bonds started to get a little bit of a bid, but that's not really good to think that it takes a 2% sell-off in the NASDAQ for anybody to buy a treasury. Um and Treasury was down, NASDAQ was down, reopening trades were down, um, gold was kind of flat, Bitcoin eventually came back flat, crude oil was getting slammed. It just You usually don't see those types of broad, pronounced sell-offs unless there's uh, something brewing in, in the market, really. And that's kind of where we're left hanging into the weekend. And it's interesting. You bring up – you know, this happened after uh, Jay Powell spoke, Chairman Powell spoke, and – um, I think, you know, in reading the, some of the texts that of his comments, I think he said that broadly speaking, the the economy is is solid. It, it, it looks very good. And therefore, they're pushing, you know, making this pledge not to raise interest rates until after 2023. So it's just kind of curious. I don't know. You know, I don't know how the, the market is just a bunch of, you know, all different people and individuals, institutions and trading, but it's interesting to see how the market responded to, to what I would think would be bullish comments. Right. And that's where <laughs> it's very, it's very circular. And 
and very confusing in terms of that kind of black box of the market's mentality. But here's what we know. We know that for a long time, these types of words from the Fed chair were bullish for markets. And now what we know is that they're not. And it's actually not just yesterday. This is what I've been harping on our programs for a while as we've been talking about the potential for yields to move very quickly. And that analysis has proven correct as we are now already 10 basis points above where economists estimated the 10-year yield would be at the end of the year. So that's where we kind of started our coverage, which was that this just seemed like a ridiculous notion that the bond would be at 1.3 percent at the end of the year. That's where the estimates were coming into 2021 when it had already established this very steady trend, of higher highs and higher lows on the yield. That goes back all the way to the first week of August. Bond yields gapped up on August 10th. And there's really only one story that kind of fits that timing of when bonds finally turned around during the pandemic and came back. And it was when the Fed leaked a paper to reporters and published a paper. Actually, they didn't really leak it. They, they published a paper through the San Francisco Fed that said they were going to embark on average inflation targeting. And it's my view that in this regime, there was very little reason to hold long bonds because the Fed has told us for the first time in history they're not going to fight inflation until it is sustained over a period of time. That means at some point in the future, if we assume the policymakers are going to continue to try and rev up the economy, which seems like a pretty simple assumption to make, they are, um, and then the economy is going to recover, which it is, and generally there's economic growth, then there's really no reason to own a bond right now until there's clarity on what the Fed is not going to tolerate in terms of inflation. So there's no real reason for bonds to just not keep moving. And so what used to be conceived as dovish – the more Powell double, triple, quadruple downs on what he's saying, that he's never going to, that he's not going to fight inflation, then you can be more and more certain that we're going to fight inflation. So why hold your long bond? And yeah. I think people are starting to realize this because the move following Powell on Thursday suggests that um, that was, I think, a wake up moment where you had that first impulse to trade like you would have back in the day when these comments would be stock and bond positive. But they weren't this time, and I think people are going to um, process this information, and it could be a very difficult thing to process just because we haven't really had a Fed that has, is, is not going to be too concerned about stocks or the long bond at the moment. They're not concerned about the yield. They're not concerned about stocks, and that's a little bit of a confusing notion for people who watched the Fed in 2018 respond to a low stock market and respond to the bond market and reverse rates. Do you remember in 2019, and now they're looking at a bond market saying, well, now we're not going to listen to you. So they've basically kind of flip-flopped what they think is important, and I think people are confused by that and are, not, are understandably kind of um, you know, taking risk off as a result. It's interesting. You almost have to be – rather than a quant, you almost have to be like a cryptographer or well, – I don't even know what the right, right word is. You have to understand the Fed speak and read between the lines. It's almost like – I don't know if you remember – yeah, yeah. Um, some of those yep. cliff, remember cliff notes? I don't know if they had them when you were going to school, but they had it when I was going to school. They and did. it was kind of help you read between the lines. You almost need a cliff notes for what the Fed, for what Fed speak is. Yeah. And it's it's almost like telegraphing your move. And I'm just putting this in Jeff Snyder terms. This is not going to be technical in any way. But if you're telegraphing what you're going to do to two, three years out, you're not going to raise rates. That sends a certain signal to the market. And maybe. Maybe you shouldn't do that. I mean, you're trying to quell any, uh, I guess, doubt about the economy and what they could and couldn't do. Right. But maybe by doing that, you actually say, okay, they're going to do, not do this. So here's how we're going to respond. Right. That's correct. So it's a fine <laughs> policy for economic growth for sure. I mean, this is what you would expect. A lot of yeah. people are saying that this is out of line and the market's competing with the Fed. I disagree. Really what it is is just – is just what you would expect if we're not going to have one of the biggest forces for ending periods of economic growth, which is rate hikes, then you can safely assume we are going to have a pretty big period of economic growth um, or at least inflation, one or the other. We're either going to get both. We're going to get either lots of growth or failed growth, which will lead to inflation. So you just don't really have a lot of reason to own bonds, and this is kind of the price of this policy after going to zero rates is just a long bond is probably going to go wild until – Either the market tightens enough for how to change or if the economy slows down enough. So it's um, – we are certainly you know, uh, in a very new regime of how the market responds to the Fed, and that is going to be a bumpy ride until people are comfortable with 
what they see. Well, I do know one thing, uh, Oliver, and that is if you want to get the scoop and just the scoop, people should tune in to the TDA network. Check out Oliver's show, Morning Trade Live and Markets on the Close, as his bookend shows. Oliver, we're going to leave it there, let you get a little bit of a cat nap, and uh, have a great rest of the weekend. We'll talk to you again very soon. All right, thanks, Jeff. Appreciate it. Take care. Bye-bye. We're going to shift gears now, talk about real estate. Joining us on the line, he is the real estate reporter for Market Watch. Jacob Passy joins us this morning. Jacob, always great to talk to you. Thanks so much for speaking with us today. Yeah, glad to be here. So what's top of mind? Uh, we had a great conversation last week. We always do every week with you on the latest real estate trends, whether it's housing, uh, getting a mortgage, et cetera. What's top of mind for you this week? I know you're doing a lot of prolific writing. Yeah, so I covered uh, an interesting analysis uh, that looked at you know, which, uh, housing, which states across the country had the most affordable housing and least affordable housing. And what was interesting about this analysis is they kind of took a little bit of a different approach than, you know, other analyses that are out there on affordability. So they took data from the National Association of Home Builders on the median price for a new home, a mm-hmm. newly constructed home, and compared that to the median uh, household income for each state, as well as the median um, mortgage rate for each state. And what was interesting about this report is the state that came out as the least affordable, uh, where the um, you know smallest percentage of households would be able to afford the mortgage monthly mortgage payment on a median priced new home. Mm-hmm. Um, based on, you know, kind of this idea that you shouldn't spend more than a third of your income on housing. And the state with where the, with, that was the least affordable was actually Vermont, not California, not uh, New York. It was Vermont. And what the researchers pointed out, given that kind of surprising result, um, and then they compared, you know, other states between each other, was that, you know, it shows how important the average wage is. So when we think of a state like California, you know, in terms of home prices alone, they obviously, you know, have the most expensive home prices in markets like San Jose, San Francisco, et cetera. But the thing is, is that a lot of people who live in those areas can't afford those prices. You know, when we're talking about San Jose, smack dab in the middle of Silicon Valley, well, you know, if you work as a programmer for a company like Google or Apple, you probably make a high enough salary that you can afford the the million dollar homes that are available there. Mm-hmm. Um, but in, you know, but in, you know, if you look uh, to other states, you know, the same price home will be, you know, less affordable. So the, so one interesting statistic they teased out was that the same when looking at affordability was that in both California and Arizona, a third of home buyers would be able to afford a median price new home on the state's median salary, but the price was quite different. So in California, that price was over 500000 and it was around, I think, 400000 for Arizona. So the same percentage of people, it just kind of shows how, how important when we think about home prices and affordability wages are. So, you know, in a state like Vermont, wages, you know, home prices there probably are quite low compared to a state like California, but the wages are also low. So as a result, you know, a smaller share of home buyers are going to be able to, you know, afford what's available in the market. Wow. So, I mean, that, that really is, you know, your buying power is really important. Uh, so what you earn, right, there's a formula that you use to figure out what you can and can't afford, right? I mean, and depending on where you live or where you think you're going to live, your buying power, how far your dollar will grow, go, excuse me, is is important and, and really play, has an impact on the type of house you're going to have uh, long term. Right, exactly. Yeah, no, you're you're exactly right. It's it's all about you know the the buying power. You know how far your dollar can stretch, and you know, and then when we think about these issues. Um, of affordability across the country, buying power, the interesting thing that's going on right now, and there's a growing concern, you know, for folks is the fact that, you know, there's a blessing and a curse involved with the new ability to work remotely. So, you know, Mm -hmm. tons of companies 
are shifting towards, you know, indefinitely working remotely. The pandemic has kind of, you know, you and I have talked about this a lot. The pandemic has kind of proven that for a lot of jobs, you can do it effectively remotely. Um, and so you are seeing people moving to further and further out places. You, you're seeing certainly a no number of people leaving high cost markets like San Francisco. But the concern that's growing is that those people, when they go and leave those markets, are moving to a market that are, you know, they're moving to markets that are much more affordable. But if that drives up demand, you know, what does that mean for the people who are yeah. already living there? So, you know, when we talk about people leaving, you know, California and then going to Phoenix as a, a popular destination, so sort of like the example I just described of how the same percentage of home buyers can, you know, afford a median price new home in California and in Arizona but the price is actually much lower in Arizona. Well, think about that. If you now have a massive influx of Californians moving to places like Phoenix, Scottsdale, you know, they're going to be driving up the home prices in those markets. And so for the people who already live there, it's going to become that much more difficult to be able to afford to buy a home. Uh, um, and you know, go ahead. Sorry, Jacob. I mean, does this mean that you're going to see this and I, maybe you're getting to this, you're going to see this migration of people. So if people, I live in the Charlotte area. There are a lot of people, as you know, I moved from New York back in October. So my wife and I live in Charlotte. We've been out looking at houses, but what we understand is that people from all across the country, it's a, you know, it's beautiful. It's a beautiful city. It's smaller. Um, of course, there's not much going on because of the, the pandemic, but as more people move in to Charlotte and buy some of these homes drives up the price does this create a, a mass exodus to other parts of the country? Uh, De Des Moines, Iowa, I think you, you mentioned, as a, as a, or parts of Iowa uh, that are – or Boise, I think you mentioned, was a, was a hot spot. So does this, does this create – if someone moves into the area, so other people are going to move out into different parts of the country? I think that remains to be seen, but I think you know that is a concern. And the, the issue is, is for the folks who, you know, if you're a person of, if you're a, whole, a household of means, you might be able to say like, well, I'm kind of getting sick of the high prices here in Boise, where we've lived for, you know, however long for generations. Maybe I'm just going to move to, you know, Coeur d'Alene in in Idaho. Yeah, that's or, nice you know, too, by the way. To, move to Spokane, Washington, or, you know, move somewhere close by. But then, it, yeah, there there are, I think, you know, I think some housing economists are starting to think about these ripple effects, you know, if we're going to start seeing people displaced from traditionally affordable cities uh, to, you know, and then what does that mean for the next city and the next city? So I think, and, and I think what this speaks to and what housing economists are talking a lot about is there's a tendency in America to view real estate as local. You know, the, mm -hmm. the situation in, you know, why do I care about what's going on in San Jose if I live in New York? But what these migration trends and the rise of remote work kind of show is that these, the issues related to the cost of housing are a national issue. You know, while there are certainly more expensive and less expensive markets, you know, when we're looking at, you know, affordability through the lens I've just described, you know, mm -hmm. who would have thought that Vermont of all places would be considered the least affordable. So it just shows how national of an issue affordability and housing is and why it's important for us to, you know, think about national solutions that can address that. Yeah. I, look, I think we've talked about this and probably ad nauseum for the purposes of the audience, but this pandemic has really set in motion. I think uh, people kind of reassessing, how they're living, where they're living. Obviously, they're moving. They moved out of these big, some of these big cities to, you know, uh, reduce their overhead, maybe get a better course of uh, sense of life. Maybe they'll move back. Businesses are adjusting, but I guess it remains to see, be seen over time exactly what those migration patterns are going to be, and ultimately what that's going to mean to the housing market. Jacob, I know you're you're very bullish that cities like New York, San Francisco. Uh, at least I believe you are come, I don't want to put words in your mouth, of course, come back after this pandemic, that there are going to be young people as always in New York city moving and, and the rents are going to go back up. I mean, it may not be in 2021, but it could be in 2022, 23, 24, et cetera. Yeah. I think that, you know, the, I think the most of housing economists do believe that those cities will see a snapback. Um, I don't know if things will you know, return to the heights that they were previously. And there is, I think, a concern in some of these markets, you know, if some of these long-term trends do, you know, pan out, you know, somewhere like Silicon Valley where, you know, home prices and rents are so high, 
you know, if enough people do leave, that's going to create, you know, opportunities for folks to, you know, buy homes, uh, but, you know, get cheaper rent, things like that. It's not clear, you know, if someone's going to, you know, it, I think what, what remains to be seen if, is if people are going to flood back and drive prices back up to the highs they were at pre pandemic. Um, that might take some time, but there's a difference between, you know, uh, you know, home prices or rent, you know, remaining high, but maybe not going back to the peak that they were once at versus, you know, f- you know, the city is dead. So I th- there's gr- there's a middle zone between those two extremes. Um, and so I think that, you know, I, I would I would advise caution in believing anyone who says any part of the country is, quote unquote, dead or yeah. or, or finished because of the, the pandemic. Uh, I think I think, you know, things will return to closer to normal soon enough. Last question, Jacob. We had the Federal Reserve announce this week that they were going to keep a pledge to keep interest rates low through 2023. It's not a direct correlation to mortgage rates, but we've seen mortgage rates creep up. Anything that you're hearing from your contacts in the industry about what the Federal Reserve, with any reaction, I guess, to the Federal Reserve and what that could mean to real estate buying? Totally. So, you just said it, you know, the, the Federal Reserve, when they change interest rates, they're affecting short term rates. They're, they're, they, they adjust what's the, called the Fed funds rate, which is a short term interest rate. Mortgage rates, obviously, you know, it's a 30 year loan or a 20 year loan, however long. Um, you know, so those are long term interest rates. So those track, rather than being adjusted by the federal funds rate, they follow the path of bond yields. And so the, you know, long term bond yields especially the 10-year treasury, um, and those have been rising. Um, and the Fed kind of, you know, their statement this week kind of suggested that they're not going to do anything. They're not worried about inflation yet. They're not going to, you know, do too much to change the situation in that market. And so, you know, bond yields could continue to rise, which means that mortgage rates could continue to rise. I think in general, most people are expecting inflation to pick up this year, which would contribute to higher interest rates. One thing that will be interesting to see in which economists I spoke with um, after the Fed decision came out this week, um, you know, said to look out for in the next you know, few months was um, uh, Powell this week talked about how they're not adjusting any of their you know, buying behavior. They've been buying the Federal Reserve has been buying a lot of um, you know treasury notes, but they've also been bu- buying mortgage-backed securities in an effort to pump liquidity into the financial markets. Um, and I think the expectation is that eventually the Fed will stop making as many of those purchases, or you know, stop making them altogether potentially. And if that happens. The economist I spoke with said you can pretty much expect mortgage rates to shoot up. Mm-hmm. Um, how high remains to be seen. I think most economists expect mortgage rates to continue to be in the 3% range this year. So, you know, not go- dropping below 3% again, but not rising to 4% or above. Um, but, uh, you know, if the Fed does, you know, think that the economy is doing fine and that it doesn't need to continue pumping money into the financial markets, then, you know, that liquidity will dry up. And when the liquidity dries up for mortgage lenders, um, then they have to raise rates to make ends meet. So um, so you could see rates go higher. I think the general expectation right now is that rates are still going to be low enough that most people won't be affected. Like the only people who would be seriously affected by that would be, you know, folks who have not yet refinanced their mortgage who are hoping to refinance. For the most part, most people who are looking to buy a home, you know, the low interest rates might be one of their motivators, but it's not their only or primary motivator. They're probably wanting to buy a home because they have kids, they just got married, they need more space to work from home, et cetera. Mm -hmm. So those are the reasons why people will buy, um, and rates are still going to be low enough that it's not going to be a disincentive. So, yeah, I think those are kind of the expectations right now. Um, but rates could also drop. They could drop if you know if the pandemic uh, continues on, if some of these uh, concerning variants start spreading more, um, and there's you know another kind of downturn in, in in employment and things like that. The Fed might ramp up its buying. They might choose to buy more mortgage-backed securities, which would allow rates to drop lower. So that's kind of what you need to watch out for. It's not so much the Fed adjusting interest rates as much as it's their you know buying activity with these bonds and. 
uh, mortgage securities. Well put, Jacob. Uh, I always feel like I walk away like I'm like a scholar now when I after I talk to you and other contributors on the show. Jacob Passy, always a pleasure chatting with you. Wishing you a great rest of the weekend, and we'll talk to you again next week, my friend. Welcome back. Now time to check out what's going on legislatively, regulatorily, and everything else on Capitol Hill. Joining us, of course, are the Legal Eagles. They are David Levine, Kevin Walsh. Both are principals with Groom Law Group and Employee Benefits Law Firm based in Washington, D.C., of all places. Gentlemen, great to talk to you as always. Good to, good to be here, Jeff. Thanks so much. And uh, happy – I don't even know what today's holiday is. You know how there's a, like a holiday for every day on the calendar? There is. I should have looked it up before I got on for the recording today. I'm sorry. Well, that's okay, David. You know, every day – it's a legal eagle's holiday if it's anything. It's the fly like an eagle holiday. Oh, every wow. Every day is fly like an eagle holiday. If there's, if there's a legal eagle holiday, I think we've just <laughs> gone too far. Wow. Maybe we could talk about something substantive instead. Yeah, let's do that. Kevin, I know you wanted to talk about some upcoming confirmation votes that are going to be happening, I think, as of tomorrow, March 22nd. What can you tell us? Yeah, so tomorrow, March 22nd, 2021. Um, <laughs> Thanks for being uh, we, specific. We filmed, this, we, we filmed this in advance. So once, once, once uh, Jeff said tomorrow, I wanted to specify the date. Um, we have the, the confirmation vote in the Senate scheduled for uh, a new Secretary of Labor. Um, so that's a, it's a cabinet level position, and ultimately uh, the Secretary of Labor gets to steer the ship and pick the personnel who who run you know the Labor Department underneath him or her, and also uh, they get to pick essentially the the leadership at the Employee Benefits Security Administration, uh, which is the agency that oversees uh, retirement benefits. So the the pick uh, is is Marty Walsh. Um, he is a politician from Boston, Massachusetts. Uh, he's a Democrat, and he's been mayor there since 2014. Um, his background, though, is, is kind of interesting because, you know, prior to his political career, he, he was very involved in organized labor. Um, so, you know, he, he joined the local union there at age 21. Uh, he was president of that union until he became mayor. Um, he was secretary, treasurer and general agent of kind of the umbrella uh, trade union uh, in Boston. Um, and, and interestingly, uh, while he was there, one of his responsibilities was serving on, you know, their pension fund. Um, serving as a trustee of the pension fund. Um, so he has, he has real experience both on kind of the labor side, which I think you'd expect from a Democrat, um, but he also has a fair amount of pension experience. Um, so when we look at like recent legislation where, uh, you know, the most recent COVID relief package uh, has a, a, a whole lot going on on the defined benefit side, particularly in the multi, multi-employer side, uh, you'd think that, that, you know, Mayor Walsh's background would have him well-suited to, you know, try to execute and implement um, on, you know, a package to, to save the multi-employer system. Um, and then if we look at the, his background on the defined contribution side, you know, managing uh, pension fund money uh, means that he has investment experience. Um, we haven't seen as much innovation uh, in terms of uh, plan uptake on, on products recently um, with kind of a, a focus on fees. But, you know, there's some chance that, you know, Mayor Walsh, with his background of, you know, heavily allocations to, you know, real estate as a way of, of helping bridge the funding gap for his uh, union up there uh, could see, you know, encouragement or, or could support uh, innovation in that area uh, in the defined contribution space. So, you know, I, I think the, the, the sense is that he's going to get confirmed tomorrow. Mm-hmm. Um, I think it would be shocking at this point for him not to be confirmed. Um, but that's a little bit of background on him. Can I ask, just interject a quick question. When you say, just from a procedural point of view, it's advice of Senate, the consent of the Senate, and what do you need in order to be confirmed? Do you need 50-50, 51, 49? I mean, obviously the vice president breaks any votes, but what is typically a, a, a confirmation vote look like in terms of so votes? At this point, at this point, you just need 50, with uh, 50 and the vice president. Okay. Um, you know, if we go back, I think it's two administrations now, it required 60. Mm-hmm. Um, but you know, I, I think both sides have have you know gradually eroded some of the norms around consensus choices. Um, it'll be interesting to see what the vote for uh, Secretary Walsh uh, or nominee Walsh looks like. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I, I think the strong sense is that he will be confirmed. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And um, did, sorry, Kev. Um, no, no, go. David, I was just going to ask you: Do you have any thoughts on on this? And I know we need to talk. We also want to talk about the deputy separate secretary. Um, as well. 
Now, admittedly, I think Kevin said it really well, so I'll hand it back to Kevin. Oh my lord! I mean, <laughs> that's I mean David, we're doing we're doing a more informative segment than usual. I mean, I'm I'm really hitting the facts <laughs> hard, talking quickly, and uh, not leaving too much of a, an opportunity for you know a little bit of crosstalk today. Uh, well, you know th- that's fine. <laughs> I, I I know you love this, so we've had our crosstalk now. So now back to you, Kevin. <laughs> Go ahead, go. Uh, so this this will be this will be relatively short. Um, so I, one of the first positions that, that Secretary Walsh is expected to fill um, is his uh, deputy secretary uh, of labor. Uh, mm-hmm. Again, and this is a position that requires Senate confirmation. Um, and the, the the pick is Julie Sue, um, and she is currently the secretary of California's Labor and Workforce Development Agency. So she's essentially the California State Labor Secretary right now. Um, and when President Biden was vetting potential nominees for labor, uh, there had been some speculation uh, that Sue would be the, the pick. Um, ultimately, uh, President Biden went with uh, Marty Walsh. But, you know, uh, Julie Sue, with her background coming out of California um, and where, you know, there have been very aggressive uh, in terms of, you know, uh, more progressive labor policies, it's going to be very interesting to see kind of the influence that she has um, because they bring different backgrounds to the table. I mean, you've got kind of a, a traditional New England uh, labor Democrat uh, at the top, and now you've got a, a fairly progressive uh, California um, Democrat as the number two. So I, I, I think we're in for a couple of interesting years where where labor's agenda will probably uh, wind its way leftward. Um, at the same time, we still don't know who's going to be the long-term head of the Employee Benefit Security Administration. Uh, and that that ultimately will have a a very large impact on on how the Biden administration shapes retirement policy. David. David. Sorry, getting David, myself getting there? myself off uh, getting myself off mute. I can hear I mean, you I've, now. I've gone through my word <laughs> quota for the week. I mean, I've I've I've, I've, I've said seven thousand words. In this is a very minutes. tame segment. I think we need David to kind of <laughs> untame it David a little fall bit. David, asleep. I think he did. I think he and listeners apparently fell asleep during my little bit this week. Well, you know, you know Kevin. Is David, I, th- is David a missing participant in, in this podcast? You know, maybe I should go missing after all these comments and leave you on your own. But, um, you know, I know I think you fit, said it pretty well. And where does this policy take us? It'll be interesting to see. We, we know oh, that, are, that... That is a bold prediction. David says it will be interesting to see. Uh, right oh, my down, Lord. Folks. Actually, fine. You want some, you want some real policy? Commentary? Yes. Yes. Uh, all right. One thing that I think is an interesting discussion and is going to be about, for Ooh, instance, an the state discussion. This is you old. know, Kevin. I oh Kevin, God. I gave you the actually talk. Maybe you could do it for me. Just me. But uh, oh. one thing that we haven't talked about in a while are like the state initiatives, like the IRA programs, the state multiple employer plan initiatives, like in Vermont. And you're seeing more and more states moving down that road. Given the background of our nominees here, it's an interesting discussion because mm-hmm. the in the Trump administration, there were actions taken to sort of roll back the Obama support of these programs. I would expect that this administration also, given, given the nominees' backgrounds, and their states focus on programs like the uh, on programs like these, both in Massachusetts and California. I think we might see some enhanced DOL support for the, whether the state IRA programs, or the states introducing their own 401k MEP programs or other types of items as we go forward. So that to me is a real takeaway because I think there is some history in both states to learn from, and that's something substantive rather than fluff like Kevin says. Before before Jeff boots us off the segment, I would never do. Would you say that guidance will ping pong? You know what? I, I've had enough ping ponging on this call today. I believe that guidance will be relatively consistent during the Biden administration, and that you are wrong. That ping ponging is the future of the world. Well, gentlemen, we're going to leave it there. And I, I knew we could not go more than seven minutes without uh, the back and forth that you gentlemen are so famous for. But look, it was a great, great topic. I think we'll be looking ahead to tomorrow just to confirm what Seth Kevin was saying to the confirmation hearing tomorrow. And we'll see how these things play out. It's going to be a very interesting well, four, three years and ever, however many days. Gentlemen, we're going to leave it there. Great to talk to you as always. Enjoy the rest of your weekend, and we'll check in with you again next week. Thanks so much, Take care. Care.
And that wraps up this episode of BRN Sunday. Have a topic of interest, someone you think we should talk to, then drop us a line. And don't forget, for all the information in retirement markets, technology, personal finance, so much more, all in one place, check out today's edition of our newsletter, The Morning Pulse. We're back again tomorrow for BRNAM. We've got very special guests from the McGovern Institute at MIT. We'll talk about cognitive brain function research. You're going to want to check that out. So until then, I'm Jeff Snyder. Stay safe, keep on saving, and don't forget, roll with the changes.